Our objective in this nugget is simple. I'd like you to imagine that you and I have just been hired on as consultants to assist a company with their wireless network. And we're thinking, great, we would love to help. And the first task they give us is, we need to add five new workstations to the wireless network. Go to it. And so we ask them, what is the uh, encryption being used for the wireless and what is the actual pre-shared key in the case of WPA2 Personal? And they say, oh golly jeepers, we don't know. Our admin, which has been gone for like a month, he didn't leave any of that information with us, but we still would like to add these customers. <laughs> now we have a couple of options. One, you and I could do password recovery on the system and try to wipe out that system, rebuild it, put a new password in. And if we did that, we might have to redo it, all the existing clients with the brand new password for WPA2, which wouldn't be a pleasant task. It might be a lot easier if we could somehow discover what the actual pre-shared key is or password that's being used with the WPA2 encryption. The thing about encryption in general is that if we take plain text and we encrypt it, anybody else in the world can go ahead and decrypt it using the same algorithm that we used to encrypt it if and only if they know the key. So for example, this plain text here, all I did was rotate the characters, each one, I think it was either 10 or 11 characters, I forget what the number is, and they're all simply offset by that amount. It's called a Caesar cipher. It's been, <laughs> been around for a long, 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 long time. And this is a simple way. So once you know the code that all these characters have been rotated or moved off of their current position by a certain number of characters, you could take this using that key, if you will, and you could interpret the actual data. Well, with the WPA2 network, obviously the customers who have that key, the pre-shared key, they're happy, they're able to use the wireless no problem, and anybody who discovers that key, like us, here in a few moments, we're gonna have that same ability to use that network. And here are the tools that we're gonna use in order to go ahead and accomplish it. Let me walk you through them step by step. To begin, I've rebooted Backtrack. So if you're following along with me from the previous nugget, I've had a nice clean reboot since the end of that previous nugget. Now, just to be sure that our interfaces are all present on this device, I can run IF config and IW config, just to verify my wireless LAN zero really is available and up and it seems like it's fine. Another way to verify our details is we could do airmon-ng and that would also verify. You don't have to run all three of those commands, but by running any one of them, you could verify that your wireless network interface card is ready. Because we had a reboot since our last time, I need to go ahead and start the wireless monitoring function. So we're gonna run airmon-ng and start, and then the name of the interface. And that should start up our logical mon zero interface that we can then use with our other tools. I do enjoy verifying that things are in the right place. So I'm just gonna run airmon-ng one more time by itself just to make sure that my monitoring interface and the physical interface. So just yet another confirmation that my monitoring interface is ready to go. All right, to get the party started, we're gonna go ahead and put some information on the screen regarding what our wireless monitor zero interface sees out there as it listens to the network. And we're gonna go after this guy right here. He's showing, let me pause the screen just for a moment. We're gonna go after the guy who has the SSID of week-2.4 sauce using PSK, which is a fancy way of saying a pre-shared key, and it's using WPA2, which again is a, it's a lot better than WPA, so he's running these guys, but WPA2, as we're gonna see in a moment, isn't completely secure unless we have some really strong passwords associated with it. And here's the MAC address that we're after as well. So I'm gonna unpause my screen, and we've been 36 seconds in, that's great. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a control C and stop that. That's the actual starting point for information that we wanna gather. We now know the AP's MAC address and the server set identifier that we wanna go after and its channel. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do arrow dump dash NG dash W. Now that's a new one. The dash W, it means we're gonna create a new file. So we're gonna write a file to our file system. I'm gonna name it our file. You could call it my file or your file or whatever it is. And it's gonna actually, the information it collects will be written to this file. The dash C is for what channel are we listening to? And we wanna go ahead and we wanna focus on channel one. So we'll put channel one there. And it's asking for the BSSID, which effectively is the MAC address, which is this guy right here, which matches that MAC address right there. And the interface, the promiscuous listening interface that we want to use for this process. And we're just gonna let it run. So with this running, it's now collecting information and writing to a file. Now there are several different methods that we, you and I could use to go ahead and obtain the actual 
WPA2 key. And what we're going to do is we're going to let this run for a while and collect data. Now, what we also could do, instead of just waiting for devices to go ahead and authenticate with the network and collect all the information for that, we could force a deauth again. We've done that before. We could do the same exact thing again. So if we already have workstations that are up and people are getting on the network and computers are going to sleep and waking back up, we really don't need to send any deauths. But because it's a boatload of fun, let's go ahead and do that right now. And we've done deauths before. So I'm going to go up and open a new window here. I'm going to go ahead and say I want to clone a session. This is with secure CRT. And let's go ahead and launch a deauth attack. And this one's saying a deauth s dash zero, no limit. You could do it two or five or ten times. And let's go ahead and launch it with the actual MAC address of the AP. Let it run a few times. I'm just going to check another machine in my network here. Well, as I turn around, and just to make sure he's going, uh, going to reauthenticate, which he is going to do right now. And he is. So let me do a control C to stop that. And I'm looking at my other computer laptop and it is reassociating all on its own. So we should have all the data we need. So it's been less than two minutes. It's one minute and change. So let's go ahead and stop this. And now that that's stopped, if we do a LS, look at our files, we have these files. Now we're really interested in the our file dash zero one dot cap. And if we ran this again with the exact same file name, it would say zero two and zero three. It's not a bad idea when you write files based on captures, maybe give them a meaningful name so that when you look back at them at a later time, you'll have a remembrance of what that capture was all about. If you use a date, which is a, may seem like a good idea at the time, when you go back, if you have a whole bunch of files with just dates on it, it may not be very helpful to remember what it was. So our final step is to go ahead and use a dictionary attack. What we're going to do is we're going to take this file called our, our file-01.cap and actually run it through with a program called aircrack-ng. We're going to go and say we want to compare that the contents of that file with this list. And this list called darkcode.lst, part of backtrack in this folder. So slash pen test, passwords, word list, darkcode.lst. I, I haven't counted how many different types of, uh, how many passwords are there, but I have reason to believe it's hundreds of thousands and it's going to go through close to a million passwords inside of that password file to see if it can calculate and reverse engineer what the actual pre-shared key is that's being used with WPA2 with that access point. So let's press enter and send it on its way. So it's cranking through and cranking through. Now, while it's cranking through, what can we possibly do? to secure our wireless? Well, the answer is, first of all, we know that just hiding the SSID doesn't do much for us. We also know that MAC address filters can be circumvented, but that doesn't mean MAC address filters are a bad idea. We wanna have multiple layers of defense. So I would recommend that you do use MAC address filters and only allow MAC addresses that you specify. And I would recommend WPA2. And I would recommend on top of that, that you use a really strong password. See, right now I'm going through over uh, close to a million passwords. So to beat that, to break that, what we would do is use a really strong password. So that includes things that have like 10 or more characters, upper and lower case, alphanumeric special characters, maybe a passphrase with two or three words strung together, swapping out, you know, zeros for O's or O's for zeros or threes for E's or whatever mechanism you want to, because that would help mitigate this type of an attack. If the password that is used for WPA2 is in this dictionary list, it's going to be solved right here. And so as it goes, it's in the D section now, and there it is. So it said, hey, congratulations. It is Dragon Breath. <laughs> that is the WPA2 password, the pre-shared key that's in use. Have at it. So even though it was using WPA2, now that we know what the pre-shared key is for that network, we can join it just like any other wireless device who's currently using that access point. In this video, we've taken a look at how we could discover the pre-shared key that's used with WPA2.